So ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, I'd like to welcome you to uh, the, I can't believe it, 41st class of fellows at the American Academy in Berlin. Um, I can remember the first class of fellows as though it was yesterday, so um, uh, it is hard for me to believe that uh, 20 years have gone by, but, uh, but they have. Um, I'd like to make a special welcome to Robin Quinville, who is the new Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in, in, in Berlin. So welcome to you, and I know you will love it here as much as, as we do. So thank you. Um, and uh, I want to say hello to Gary on Sievernick, who is uh, doing us a great favor tonight to introduce our fellows, and you'll be hearing from him later in the evening. But Gary on, as, as you all know, is the Help Stott Kulfur Funds uh, director, and so welcome to you and Mrs. Sievernick as well. Um, uh, on behalf of my uh, fellow trustees, Christine Wallach and John Kornblum, who is uh, coming later this evening, um, I want to uh, sincerely uh, say to you that after uh, 41 classes of fellows, we, we sort of feel like we, we have it down, but it's always a new start. And, we welcome our fellows very much uh, this evening. I don't want to conclude my welcome, so without welcoming uh, Gary Smith, our first executive director, our founding executive director, who, who uh, for 20 years uh, took Richard Holbrook's idea and turned it into the reality that the Academy is today. So Gary, welcome to you. Um, it is uh, very good luck, uh, and I guess it is luck, that we not only welcome our 41st class of fellows this evening, but I also have the pleasure to introduce our new president, Terry McCarthy, who arrived just last week. He, he, I think this, this is his third full day at the Academy. Um, so uh, Terry, uh, uh, comes to us. He hails from Los Angeles uh, and where he was the president of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council. Prior to that, he was a foreign correspondent uh, as well as Time Magazine's uh, Los Angeles bureau chief. He has, over the course of his career, been recognized with an Edward R. Murrow Award, four Emmys, and the Asian Human Rights Press Award. So, uh, Terry, we welcome you very much, and you all will be hearing from Terry momentarily. Um, 20 years have passed. Uh, uh, it's hard for me to uh, think back to 20 years ago, but Gary, it does seem like yesterday when we welcomed our first class on the lawn, uh, 20, September 26, 1998. Um, the world was different then. Berlin was different. Berlin was a city of, of change then. It was a city of hope. Uh, and it was a great, it was a city of great optimism. Um, and since then, there have been lots of up and, ups and downs in the, in the U.S.-German relationship. Uh, but I feel as though we've weathered a lot of them. Uh, because we have uh, shared values and a commitment to what is often called the liberal international order. Um, once again today, um, the transatlantic relationship is being tested. Uh, there are trenchant geopolitical and immigration problems to be confronted climate change to be addressed, trade agreements to be negotiated, and an increasingly digital world that is opening up borders and demanding from us a new way of confronting old tensions and means of livelihood. Um, all of these issues require actors with a sense of commitment to democratic values that have been integral to the post-war global system for the last 70 years. 
these are values of openness, of openness and tolerance, of intellectual curiosity, compassion, honesty, and a sense of responsibility for the kinds of societies we create, inhabit, and pass on. And while these values are, of course, essential to the democratic political culture, they are most effectively promoted outside the realm of politics entirely. Uh, this is why, for me, institutions like the American Academy in Berlin um, are so important, uh, brokering transatlantic uh, relationships by creating a space for the personal relationship is what will hopefully sustain these, uh, these institutions and, and friendships. Um, for the past 20 years, I hope that this house, through those conversations, um, have been spurred by scholars, writers, composers, filmmakers, poets, philosophers, journalists, and artists. Uh, we have done so in the hopes that the personal and intellectual bonds forged outside of politics will, over time and more permanently, ultimately affect the tenor of our discourse. Right now, this kind of slow diplomacy is something that I think is actually more important than the political diplomacy that is going on. Sorry, Robin. <laughs> um, um, for those of you who knew Richard Holbrook, you know that this is the vision that he had for this institution. I believe that he would be proud of what it is today. I know he would be proud of the fellows that you will meet later this evening. And so with uh, that bit of nostalgia and looking back, I would like to look forward now and have you meet our new president, Terry McCarthy. Thank you, Gail. Allow me to say welcome also to all of you, uh, friends of the American Academy. Uh, es ist wirklich eine große Ehre für mich heute, mit so vielen bedeutenden, verehrten Gästen hier zu sein. Äh, ein herzliches Willkommen an allen. Und wir hoffen, dass Sie in den kommenden Monaten und Jahren oft wieder zurückkommen. Allow me also to give a big shout out to my staff. It's been a priority for me. I've only been here since last Thursday to try and get to know them. Um, but I can already tell that this is the most extraordinary group of people. Any of you who've come here before, know how well the staff run the events here, keep the villa going, look after the fellows. Um, I'm very much looking forward to working with them, and I think we're very lucky to have them. Um, I know it's been somewhat challenging recently, but um, I'm looking forward to working with them closely in the future. And I'm also delighted that my legendary predecessor, Gary Smith, is here tonight. Um, thank you so much for coming, Gary. Uh, one word here on my love for Germany, which started early and for a particular reason, which is important. I came here first uh, when I was 14 years old to spend a spring and a summer semester in a Benedictine monastery school uh, near Kitzingen, which is called Münster Schwarzach. It's quite a well-known monastery. They even have their own recording label for their Gregorian chants, which were beautiful. Um, but for me, as a 14-year-old coming from Ireland, where I grew up, it was a place where I learned that you could have mint-flavored tea <laughs> and not just mint-flavored chewing gum, which is what I was used to. I also discovered that you could have sausages for lunch and for dinner, not just for breakfast, which was also what I was used to. Um, and I learned that there were many different ways of doing and thinking about things that were not wrong, they were just simply different. I think this is an enormously valuable lesson for a young person to have. Uh, if one delays foreign travel until one's in one's 40s, everything you see that is different is somehow wrong. That's not the way we do it at home, and you tend to have uh, prejudices. If you travel abroad when you're young, you go with an open mind, and that leaves you, I think, uh, in a much better position to come to terms with the world. And of course, my career then ended up bringing me to many different cultures, and I believe it helped me uh, to be open-minded, and that's where I learned. I learned it first here in Germany. So uh, that's uh, one of my fondest memories of, 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 of uh, my first exposure to Germany. Um, I should say I also developed a lifelong devotion of bratwurst. 
as you know, bratwurst. As you know, I come here from Los Angeles, and I'm delighted to see that we have the same blue skies and sunny weather that we enjoy in Southern California. <laughs> and I've assured my wife and children this weather continues throughout the year. Uh, my wife, Jennifer, uh, who's from Texas, uh, and I, we have four children, Christopher, who's 13, Isabel, who turned 12 yesterday, I'm sad that I missed her birthday, uh, Caroline, who's 11, and Eloise, who is nine. Um, they will be finishing the school year in the United States because the turnover was just too quick. And then they will move to Berlin next summer and they'll, we'll find schools for them here. So we're looking forward to having them come. And also coming with them will be our two German shepherds who regard this as a repatriation. <laughs> Meanwhile, I will be working hard to get to know all of you um, and all the friends of the Academy uh, to further elevate the role of this wonderful institution, um, which Gary did so much to, 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 to get underway, and to help in any way I can our wonderful group of fellows, whom you'll be hearing from shortly, um, in, in, uh, introduced by Professor Gerion Siebernich. Um, after the fellows have all spoken, I will come back to talk just a little bit more about Socrates and his habit of tweeting, which I'm sure you don't know much about, but I can reveal something. Uh, let me um, turn now to uh, Professor Siebernich. Uh, one of the most visible figures in Berlin's cultural life, Professor Siebernich curated key shows for the Berliner Festspiele beginning in the 1970s, and he became director of the Martin Gropius Bau in 2001. For the next 17 years, he transformed it into a national and international venue for modern and contemporary art and architecture. And he put up some 190 exhibitions. That's extraordinary. Um, from Frida Kahlo and Rebecca Horn to Ai Weiwei and art from Africa, Asia, and South America. In fact, over dinner, we were talking about his 80 trips you've made to Japan in that time and the equivalent number to China, quite extraordinary. We actually share a great interest in Japan and China and, and look out for some uh, Asian programming in the uh, American Academy in the, in the years to come, because that's a, an area I think is very important for us to look at. Um, anyway, Professor Sievenich will be in discussion with Ai Weiwei here, um, renewing that connection on the November 26th. So please put that in your calendars. I can assure you that will be a very interesting uh, conversation. This year, Professor Sievenich became the curator for the Hauptstadtskulturfonds, where his expertise is well-resourced in evaluating and supporting contemporary cultural and artistic projects in Berlin and strengthening interregional and international cultural dialogue with Berlin. A wonderful job to do, too. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Sieveni. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear Mrs. Bird, dear Terry McCarthy, and uh, dear Mr. Quinquil, Mrs. Quinquil, sorry, my voice is a little bit rusty. And of course, uh, hello, Gary. I also remember what happened 21 years ago. I think I participated in the first presentation of the scholars in, when was it, 1998? Wow. Thank you, Gary, for coming tonight. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak on the occasion of the arrival of the new scholars. I was told to speak about Berlin. So with pleasure, I'm your Cicerone, if you like that. Let me begin with a quote regarding the topic language. Mark Twain wrote about German language in his notebook, reflecting his five months in Berlin in 1891 and 1892. Berlin is a wonderful city for that sort of opportunity. <clears throat> they teach everything here. I don't believe there's anything in the whole earth that you can't learn in Berlin except the German language. <laughs> it is a desperate language. They think it is a language of concentration. They hitch a catalog train of words together and vestibule it. And because there isn't a break in it from one end to the other, those who learn German know that problem very well. They think that is a concentration, and they call it so. I wrote a chapter on this language 13 years ago and tried my level best to improve it and simplify it for these people. And this is the result. It merely concentrates the alphabet with a shovel. It hurts me to know that that chapter is not in any of the textbooks, and they don't use it in universities. If I could get an imperial decree, it would help the reform along. Maybe remember that Mark Twain had a dinner with the emperor at that time. Quote, ending. 
You might think about what is the best way to learn German, unfortunately, I don't know. And probably this chapter was never written by Mark Twain as far as I can know him. Mm -hmm. Let me go to the next point, who, who am I? Actually, I'm the curator of a fund called Hauptstadt Kulturfonds. Mark Twain would have liked the word. I translate it, I translate it for you as Capital Cultural Fund. The money, 50 million each year, comes from the federal government and is meant to support cultural projects in Berlin. Not about Berlin, but in Berlin. A jury of seven meets twice a year to find out of approximately 500 to 600 applications which of the artistic projects should be recommended for support. It is one of the nicest job I ever had because you do not have to find the money, it's already there. <laughs> Before nominated curator, I was, uh, as Ter mentioned already, a 17 years director of the Martin Kropius Bau, named after the architect Martin Kropius, who was a great uncle of the more famous Walter Kropius. I was responsible to develop and present exhibitions about 200 exhibitions we did show in this time. We had no collection. My first project was dedicated to Crystal, one of the many more American artists whose work we presented, like Lee Miller, Kappa, Avedon, Cindy Sherman, and others, followed. The Gropus Bau today is one of the exhibition sites I recommend to visit. In the first half of my career as a cultural manager, I organized festivals and could invite hundreds of artists from Africa, from South America, from North America, from Asia, Japan, China, Korea, Indonesia. I traveled to Beijing and Cairo, to Mexico and Rio de Janeiro, to Tokyo and Bali, to Nairobi and Mexico. And I traveled probably more miles than our foreign ministers altogether. Having studied at the Freie University, which was founded with the money of the Ford Foundation, as you know. My career was not an academic one, but for many years I did teach at the Goethe University of Frankfurt as honorar professor. Honorar means you don't get anything. <laughs> uh, and, gave, and gave lectures at my old alma mater in Berlin. Also, I can report to have, at least, to have met at least five presidents of the United States, Kennedy and Johnson in Cologne, Clinton, Bush, and Obama in Berlin. And if I would have talked to them, it would be a secret. Now I would like to say a word about nature. Please take a look. Sorry, I thought it's open. <laughs> <laughs> Out of these windows, but you use your imagination. What you see is not a lake, but a river, the Havel. If you like to rent a sailing boat, if you go to the left, you reach Hamburg and possibly America and to the right, you could reach Sweden. If you go by boat to Sweden, I recommend to arrange a stopover at the city center of Berlin near Pergamon Altar. You know the Hohenzollern castles, which you probably will all visit. They all build along these waterways. So it's a very interesting study possible about communication in old times. Berlin has, no, has so many lakes and rivers within the borders of the city that I have difficulties to mention them all. Of the 350 square miles, Berlin <clears throat> covers nearly one third, is covered by forests and lakes and rivers. You might even not be able to see the forest for the trees. Unfortunately, you have come in autumn, but maybe in this winter, if you're lucky, you can ice skating on some of the lakes. But regarding nature, <clears throat> this story scientifically might be more interesting. <clears throat> Hunting neutrinos. In Zeuthen, you find an institute called DESI, German Electron Synchrotron. You can go there by S-Bahn. They, they search together with the University of Wisconsin for rare neutrinos. I say rare neutrinos because neutrinos are everywhere, but not this one they search for. Using an internationally organized astronomical track net, scientists have for the first time located a source of high energy cosmic neutrinos, ghostly elementary particles that travel billions of light years through the universe. Billions of light years. Flying unaffected through stars, planets, entire galaxies, and here in the room also. 
The joint observation campaign was triggered by a single neutrino that had been recorded by the Ice Cube Neutrino Telescope at the South Pole on September 2017. Telescopes on Earth and in space were able to determine that the exotic particle had originated in a galaxy nearly 4 billion light years away, in the constellation of Orion, where a gigantic black hole serves as a natural particle accelerator. Cosmic neutrinos are messengers from the high energy universe. Demonstrating the presence of neutrinos is extremely complicated. However, because most of the ghostly particles travel right through the entire Earth without leaving a trace, only on very rare occasions does a neutrino interact with its surroundings. It therefore takes huge detectors in order to capture at least a few of these rare reactions. For the ice cube detector, an international consortium of scientists headed by the University of Wisconsin in Madison drilled 86 holes into the Antarctic ice, each 2,500 meters deep. 86 holes. Into these holes, they lowered 5,106 light sensors spread out over a total volume of one cubic kilometer. The sensors register the tiny flashes of light that are produced during the rare neutrino interactions in the transparent ice. Quote ending. It is one of the most inciting international scientific projects going on and you can participate in a way here in Berlin. A great story, some Nobel Prizes are waving. Now let me speak about science and education. Here's some more statistic data. 3.4 million inhabitants in Berlin, about 100 religions, about 200 nationalities, and probably 200 or more languages are spoken in Berlin. We have four universities, the so Humboldt University is the oldest, founded in 1810, and the Freie University, the youngest, founded in 1948, at the beginning of the Cold War. And we have 35 colleges of higher education and altogether 180,000 students. Also five of the Max Planck Institutes, the Wissenschaftskolleg, the Wissenschaftszentrum, and so on. 84 public libraries we register in Berlin. Important for you are the University Library of the Free University, partly built by Sir Norman Foster, the recently opened library of the Humboldt Universität, and the fantastic State Library built by Hans Scherun near the Philharmonie. All are worthwhile to see, even if you don't need it maybe, today anymore, because you look at your iPad more than you go into a library, it's worthwhile to see it because of the architecture. And the State Library has a second seat for old books under the Linden. <clears throat> if you do research on America, the John F. Kennedy Institute of the Freie Universität of Berlin has the best library. And I would like to speak about culture, or should I say leisure and distraction. <laughs> <coughs> I'm sure sometimes you would like distraction, I don't know how the rules here are, how strict, but take your time, take your leisure time. Berlin has offered so much. Theatre, 56 theatres are waiting for you. <clears throat> so easily you can study neutrinos one day and pack it on the next day. Museums, around 160 museums are waiting for you, of which maybe 20 are first class. I mentioned the National Gallery, opened 1968 by Mies van der Rohe, but unfortunately, it's closed for reconstruction. I mentioned the beautiful old museum built by Schinkel in 1830, which is open and houses the fabulous antique collection of Berlin. Unfortunately, the Pergamon Altar next door is under restoration for some years. I heard you had already a sightseeing tour, so you crossed the Pergamon Museum's island, I guess. But in November, the State Museum shall open a temporary exhibition with a gigantic hand-painted panorama of the old city of Bergamon, which, as you know, also this old city had a fantastic library. 
And across the street, the Humboldt Forum is opening up in 2019, remembering the 250th birthday of Alexander von Humboldt, who, you remember, met in the year 1804, Thomas Jefferson, in Washington. This Humboldt Forum will present art from Asia, Africa, and South America. I shall not mention the 400 galleries, because it might be too demanding to see them all for you. Music, you can visit three opera houses. No other European has three opera houses. And you can visit three big concert halls, of which the Philharmonie, built in expressionistic style by Hans Scharoun, as well as the Chamber Music Hall next door, are very spectacular. And recently, Simon Rettel was artistic director of this orchestra. Now it is Kirill Petrenko. Literature. This week is going on for the uh, writers. Uh, this week is going on a festival on literature, like every year. It lasts 10 days. 200 writers from all over the world are our guests, and there are two houses dedicated to the presentation of writers all over the year, one of which you can find next door, the Literarische Colloquium, 10 minutes from here. I shall not mention more places of distraction, but there are still, one must say, 270 cinemas, not to mention the clubs, the nightlife. Berlin is open 24 hours. And if you like to hear an American radio station, you can find it under FM 104.1. John Kornblum is involved in this radio station, yeah. as you know. The KCRV, which means college radio something station, and it's from California. So it cooperates with the National Public Radio, which gave back its license last year, unfortunately. KCRW is a private initiative which wants to help to strengthen the relations between Germany and the United States. And there's also a magazine in English called Expolina, which gives you actual information on what is going on in Berlin culturally if you don't read the Tagesspiegel or the Berliner Zeitung, to mention both. <laughs> Last but not least, I wanted to mention how intertwined the scientific life of Berlin with America and the other way around was in history. I could have talked about Franz Boas, who in 1886, having been privatdozent at the university in Berlin, went to America and founded what is today cultural anthropology. I could have talked about V.E.B. Dubois, who studied around 1892 in Berlin, as did at this time 150 other Americans. And I could have talked about all those German scientists who were forced to leave Germany after 1933. Passport Toto, I mentioned Reinhard Bendix, who was born in Berlin and who was a refugee and became an influential American sociologist. I could have talked about the refugee Albert Einstein, and I could have, if you have time, please try to see the Einstein Tower in Potsdam, which was built in the 1920s by the famous architect Erich Mendelssohn, and which was built to do research on the red shift of light. We all know what this is, but it's one of the most important questions in natural sciences. Also, it would be interesting to speak about all those Americans who became influential in scientific life in Berlin. I started research online in the library of my old university, and I did find 190,000 entries. For the time being, I gave up and think I should apply for a scholarship to be able to give a better report next time. <laughs> However, I wish you a nice time in Berlin, full of research and distraction. Now the fellows shall present their work, starting with Alexander Galloway. Welcome, and whom I beg now to take the stage. Thank you for your attention. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm pleased and honored uh, to be here, to be a resident here at the American Academy in Berlin um, as the Axel Springer Fellow. Um, my project here at the Academy is called The Crystalline Medium, Computation 
and its consequences. And it's about computers and, uh, and digitality. It's an archivally driven project. Um, and I'm, I, I don't typically work with historical archival sources, but um, that's what this project is all about. The work really coalesces around three historical sites. Um, the first is 19th century photography, specifically um, what's called chronophotography, or the art of taking pictures through time. The second site, uh, for the second site, I shift to the 1950s. And I'm, I'm looking there at uh, what's called cellular automata and some experiments in artificial life. Specifically, a series of experiments that were performed by the mathematician Niels Baricelli at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. And finally, I have exhumed a nearly forgotten chapter in the life of Guy Debord, the French situationist author and filmmaker. In, uh, toward the end of his life, in, in 1977, to the surprise of, of many people, I think, he founded his own game company, and he released a commercial game. And I've, res I've researched this game exhaustively and even uh, rewritten a version of it in software. So my overall goal with this project is really has sort of two, two parts to it. I want to expand the conceptual frame through which we speak about computers and digital things in general. So it's not just objects made out of plastic and silicon for me. Um, but I also want to open the historical window to move beyond the locus classicus of the late 20th century. Um, so for me, computation and digitality are are historical realities, of course, and empirical realities, but they are also um, kind of structural or even rational conditions. And I want to use those structure, the uh, kind of more structural definition of the digital as a way to reveal new things about the historical archive. So if you're interested in any of these things, I invite, I'm one of the first um, uh, speakers, uh, and I'll be speaking next week, uh, uh, September 20th. Thank you very much. Hey, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Priscilla Lane, and I'm the Anna Maria Kellen uh, Fellow here at the Academy. Um, and here in Berlin, I'm working on my second book, which is entitled Out of This World, Afro-German Afrofuturism. Um, so Afrofuturism is a term that was coined by um, white British uh, cultural theorist Mark Derry in 1994 uh, to describe African Americans who either use science fiction, speculative fiction, or fantasy in order to represent um, the feeling of alienation that black people have felt since transatlantic slavery, or use technology um, in order to kind of help black people towards liberation. Um, so Derry focused on African Americans. And since then, um, the term Afrofuturism 2.0 has been introduced in order to acknowledge that this is a, a more global phenomenon um, across artists across the diaspora. And I like to point out that for me, Afrofuturism is quite different from older futurisms, so say Italian futurism of the interwar period, which was very much focused you know, just on the future, you know, celebrating war, um, very misogynist um, and fascist eventually. Um, in contrast, Afrofuturism is both about the future and the past. So part of it is about either recovering or, or kind of reimagining um, African futures to kind of contradict um, negative understandings of you know, Africa not being able to contribute to, to human civilization. So kind of negating Hegel's claim you know, that Africans are outside of history. Um, but I would also say that Afrofuturism is very also different than, say, accelerate accelerationism, which is a more uh, current form of futurism, um, which would argue that we go towards alienation, kind of this idea that we can reach a utopian future if we let capitalism spin itself out. Um, so in contrast, I would say that Afrofuturists would say that um, black people already are like at the end of alienation, um, having been historically excluded from the category of the human as it's been defined um, in Western society. Um, so 
for me, Afrofuturism is also non-hierarchical. So it's not about inverting power dynamics. It's not about putting black life at the top of the chain of being, but more so about a kind of a post-humanist acknowledgement of the value of, of lives, not just human lives, but non-human animals, more um, trying to get in balance with the universe. Um, so by focusing on Afro-German Afrofuturism, I also recognize a shift within um, black German history or black German cultural production. Um, so a lot of the black German writing um, since the 1980s has been autobiographical or realist, so dealing with the experience of black people in Germany. Um, so for me, this project is interesting because I'm looking at a, several authors who you know, are using fantasy, but still dealing with questions of you know, what is German national identity, so deconstructing that, um, crit critiquing whiteness, um, decentering the the kind of white German male subject um, and addressing German colonialism, um, but doing all this through fantasy and kind of toying with science fiction. Um, and for me, being in Berlin is really perfect for this project because several of the authors that I'm working on, whose sex I'm working on, live and work in Berlin. Um, so like uh, Olivia Wenzel or Simone Dede Ayivi, who are playwrights who have staged plays at the Bauhaus Naunichstrasse Theater in Kreuzberg, or like um, Philip Cabo Kupsel, who's a spoken word poet who performs at the Each One Teach One Center in Berlin Wedding. So it's a really exciting time for me to be in Berlin uh, amidst these conversations about de decolonialism and uh, Afrofuturism. So, thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jula Gazdag. I'm a filmmaker, a screenwriter, and a teacher, originally uh, coming from Budapest, Hungary. I was born and raised there and uh, started uh, my career there. Uh, my career was, uh, um, as a filmmaker, mostly full of absurdity uh, since it all happened during communist times and uh, uh, it was a constant fight with censorship uh, because I was uh, determined to make, uh, uh, to tell stories about uh, the human condition and about uh, the lack of basic human rights during communism. So at some point I had uh, nine films banned and then I moved to theater where I learned a lot about working with actors. And later, uh, uh, at the uh, end of the 80s, right before communism collapsed, I ended up in Los Angeles and started to teach. Started to teach uh, directing, storytelling, uh, uh, writing scripts. And uh, uh, I was thinking at that time that actually teaching is more important for me than making movies. Uh, briefly after that, I got uh, also uh, uh, involved in the work of the Sundance Institute. And now for the last 21 years, uh, uh, I was uh, 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 really proudly part of a lot of uh, independent American films uh, uh, being written and made. Uh, just. Uh, as a short introduction, I had to tell you all this because I think that the project I'm working on here, uh, which is called uh, a Tourist Trip to Hell, and uh, uh, which uh, got me selected as the Ellen Maria Gorison Fellow for this semester, is a project that in a way returns to the roots of my work it's based on a newspaper ad that was published in the Basel and Nachrichten in 1921, advertising a tourist trip back to the battlefields of uh, uh, the Western Fort in the First World War. And uh, the, the research I'm doing is partially about uh, uh, what happened on these trips that the Basel and Nachrichten uh, uh, announced also uh, uh, about the absurdity of the encounter of uh, these young Swiss people who went on these trips with uh, uh, the reality of the war. 
So the concept of the project is that uh, uh, they go to, uh, uh, to near Verdun, uh, to the battlefields, uh, the road behind their cars blows up because there are so many uh, uh, bombs and grenades left there, and they have to spend the night there walking back uh, to their hotel, and they encounter uh, the souls of the soldiers who were fallen on those fields. And uh, what I'm doing here uh, mostly is um, uh, uh, I want to read as many as possible personal accounts of people who died uh, uh, or who survived uh, uh, the war as soldiers on the Western Front and uh, create characters based on those personal accounts and create the confrontation between these uh, dead people and the, uh, uh, the life who, by the time uh, uh, the sun comes up again, forget about everything that they saw because I think that we are in this moment when we are forgetting uh, uh, what it was like uh, uh, to live in war times. So that's the project I would like to, not to complete, but at least uh, uh, complete the research while I'm here. And I'm really thankful for the support that I got so far. I think that I accomplished more during these three weeks that, uh, uh, that I spent here than years before. And also, I'm really thankful for uh, getting me acquainted with my uh, 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 fellow fellows and be able to learn from them. And uh, I can see that actually there is a community that is being formed right now. And uh, we care for each other. We like each other. So uh, I think that these are uh, uh, friendships that uh, are being forged thanks to the academy uh, uh, and uh, i'm really looking forward for the, uh, to the rest of the stay uh, uh, here in berlin thank you uh, good evening uh, I um, am P. Carl, and uh, I have the honor of being the Holtbrink Fellow here. Uh, my uh, wife has made me promise not to riff, uh, so I'm going to stick to my uh, script here. Uh, and I want to say a special thank you to Lynette, uh, who uh, is here with me, and also my heartfelt thanks to the American Academy. Uh, this fellowship in only a few weeks has given me more support, uh, more time, and more space than any artist could ever hope for. It's it's impossible really to express the impact of a gift like this. Also, uh, thank you to my uh, cohort of fellows for your brilliance um, and your excellent capacity for stimulating and thank God never boring dinner conversation uh, <clears throat> because we've had more dinners together than I've ever had with any other group of people. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, I am working on my memoir, Becoming a White Man. Uh, it is a 50-year journey from living as a girl and then a queer white woman to becoming a white man. Uh, if you are following along uh, in the world of American politics uh, and sexual harassment scandals, you might wonder about my timing uh, for this journey. Um, but um, as a, a theater maker and scholar in cultural studies, I have spent a lifetime thinking about how to tell good stories, uh, how to tell stories that transform our understanding of otherness, discrimination, the injustices that come with trying to make a life and to define a self. To be here in Berlin is particularly meaningful, where the stories and scholarship of Brecht, Benjamin, Arendt have formed so much of my understanding of the relationship between art and politics. This book is the evolution of an artistic career and also a life lived. I will share with you just the opening paragraph of the book's introduction, which describes my project well. Uh, it starts, March 16, 2017, the Chandler Hotel in Midtown Manhattan, seven months on testosterone. I have been living as a white Midwestern girl, woman, for 50 years and 10 months. On this weekend in March, I cross a line. It comes unexpectedly on this particular day, but I've been thinking and expecting it for as long as I can remember. I check into the hotel about 6 p.m. Good evening, sir. How are you? 
This isn't my first, sir. They have come and gone my entire life, and more often in recent weeks. But it's the start of something that from this sir forward will be my new life. On March 16th of 2017, at the Chandler Hotel, I become a white man. I cross a line, and I join a club that will define my reality from now on. This book explores family origins, westerns, there's a lot of bourbon in it, uh, learning to swim, white masculinity, uh, and the trauma of being shaped by masculinity, and the joy of becoming a man. If you want to hear from the book, I'm going to deliver um, a chapter or so, and I am the first fellow to do so, and I will be reading next Tuesday right back here on September 18th. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karina Johnson, and I'm delighted to be the Nina Maria Gorison Fellow in History uh, for the fall of 2018. I've come to Berlin precisely to use those tremendously rich library collections that we've heard about today for a project that reassesses the relationship between civic society and warfare in the early modern period, in a time span ranging from about the late 15th to the early 17th centuries. The history of war and society during that era is often characterized as the military revolution. And as such, it focuses on state building, technologies defined widely, and international power relations. Yet as we all know, war, whether near or distant, produces profound cultural consequences for the societies and the individuals who fight in it or flee it. My project then examines Central European home front experiences of the German Ottoman Wars during a period when a militarized front emerged in Hungary and Croatia between the Holy Roman and the Ottoman Empires, a period when German propaganda turned the Ottomans into what was called the hereditary enemy of the Germans. My work proposes that throughout the German speaking world, ideas and practices of justice, of citizenship, of masculinity, of violence, of Christianity, and the definition of who is truly human. All of these ideas and practices were transformed um, in the course of this long and hot and cold conflict. My goal is to explore and better understand these issues through the experiences and the choices of ordinary men and women in locations ranging from Silesia and Transylvania to Trent and to Basel, to Strasbourg, and here in Brandenburg. And I look forward to presenting my arguments in early December. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Tung Hui Hu, and I'm the Dirk Epen Fellow uh, this fall at the American Academy. Um, I just thought I would say thank you so much to the Academy, um, especially to the staff. I've never felt so well cared for and rooted on, really, um, every time I walk through those doors. So, um, I teach creative writing and digital media at the University of Michigan. As an academic, I'm part of a generation of scholars that critically study the relationship between technology and society. I think we're interested in bringing to public attention the ways that uh, invisible or seemingly neutral design decisions in our digital environment can reproduce and exacerbate societal inequalities, negatively impact uh, labor conditions or the environment, or even buttress a state's policing apparatus. We go about our work in different ways, of course, and the way that I think I go about it, um, it often starts with examining digital media's historical origins uh, to better describe latent structures of economic and political power that profoundly shape it. Uh, so to give an example, uh, my previous book uh, on the prehistory of the cloud, I found that Victorian thinking about hygiene and sewer systems lingers in the way that users are all sharing the same pipes and plumbing for internet traffic, even as we internalize the idea that these pipes are ours and private. Uh, where our data goes and who is at the other end of these pipes has certainly been in the news recently. And one of my more unexpected conclusions from that last study is that fighting back against digital platforms is often counterproductive. That to offer one example of movements to watch the watchers to counter surveil the surveillers can sometimes reinforce the paranoid mentality that makes security states thrive. 
Whereas framing critique in terms of fighting back or speaking up can be dangerous because deciding what is political or qualifies as resistance is always a loaded question that intersects with questions of gender and race. So who gets to take a stand in the street and who is left behind doing childcare um, is speaking up always more political than listening. So as a result, my next book project takes a step back. It's about what happens when digital capitalism co-ops traditional measures of political action and political speech becomes another form of feedback for tuning marketing algorithms. The result is what I call lethargy, the feeling of being caught within digital systems that purport to offer users unprecedented freedom, participation, and empowerment when often not offering any real choice at all. Lethargy is in short the feeling of having bad options. One is both unable to act and is also discouraged from acting, a stalemate which looks outwardly like passivity or reticence or laziness or disengagement or lassitude. My book explores lethargy by investigating a set of artworks that seem to embody this ambivalence, uh, whether a device that aims to get its users to become more sedentary rather than more active, or a performance that critics dismiss because it moves too slowly to look like a performance. Um, such forms of lethargic art can open up new sets of directions for critique um, that we typically overlook because we uh, have ingrained expectations about what critique and political engagement looks like. Uh, in a digital age that one writer termed a post-couch potato moment because we're all impelled to interact and be engaged all the time, I'm interested in what happens if that much maligned couch potato gets the last laugh. If you're interested in knowing more, my talk is on November 8th. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and thank you for coming. Thanks also to the wonderful staff at the Academy for organizing this event. And I also want to echo um, my fellow fellows in saying that it's been a really wonderful time being here and getting to know all of you. My name is Ya Jesse, and I am the Mary Ellen von der Heiden Fellow in Fiction this fall at the American Academy. Much of my fiction is concerned with race and migration and the ways in which where we are from informs who we are. This is a personal interest of mine. I was born in Ghana, but immigrated to America at age two. My family then proceeded to move four more times over the course of my first 10 years of life, from Ohio to Illinois to Tennessee, ultimately ending up in Alabama. I often say that I don't think I would have written my first novel, Homegoing, if I hadn't grown up in Alabama, a state where my identity, both as a Ghanaian and as a black American, was forged and keenly felt. Homegoing is a novel that follows the family lineage of two half-sisters born in the Gold Coast in the 18th century. Afia, the first half-sister, is the wife of the British governor of the Cape Coast Castle, which is a slave fort that still stands in what we now refer to as Ghana. Essie, the second sister, is kept in that very castle as a slave before being sent to America. The novel then follows down the line, descendant after descendant, as the characters move within the Gold Coast and all across America, dealing with the political forces, not just of their particular moments in history, but of the countries, states, and cities that become their homes. In addition to race and place, I'm also deeply interested in how trauma shapes families. In Homegoing, this trauma was that of the kind of macro-aggressive overt forces, such as slavery, colonialism, Jim Crow, war. My new novel, which I will be working on here at the Academy, is also interested in race and migration, trauma, and family, but the scope is much more intimate. In this still untitled novel, I focus on a family of four Ghanaian Americans who are dealing with loss, loss of home, loss of loved ones, loss of self. It's a novel that hopes to look at the psychic cost of immigration, as well as addiction, depression, as we follow Gifty, the protagonist, a neuroscience PhD candidate, as she studies reward-seeking behavior in awake, behaving animals. I am delighted to be here at the American Academy in Berlin 
and deeply honored and grateful to have been given this space and time to work on this new novel. If you'd like to hear more about it and hear a selection from it, I'll be reading um, in that room there on Thursday, September 27th. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Hans Saucy from the University of Chicago, and this fall I have the honor of being the John P. Birkeland Fellow in the Humanities at the Academy. My project is to make as much headway as possible on a book about the interrelationships of the literatures of East Asia in the pre-modern period, meaning China, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, Tibet, Mongolia, Manchuria, and Muslim Central Asia. You might wonder what all this has to do with Germany and why I am thinking about these things in Berlin. Well, there are two reasons, one of which is old and the other of which was, frankly, unanticipated. For the first reason, in 1827, Goethe, in a conversation noted down by Eckermann, launched the phrase world literature, saying that national literatur will jetzt nicht viel sagen. Die Epoche der Weltliteratur ist an der Zeit und jeder muss jetzt dazu wirken, diese Epoche zu, zu beschleunigen. Right. The, year, the age of national literature is closed. We are now entering the era of world literature and everyone has the duty to help hurry it along. Marx and Engels, 20 years later, in the Communist Manifesto, seized upon this phrase to capture the essence of an era in which, as they saw it, all national and cultural boundaries were being dissolved by the power of the capitalist market. Well, like many things predicted in the Manifesto, uh, this world literature has not exactly come to pass. But the idea alerts us to the horizon of a culture that would claim to be of something more than parochial and regional interest. What would such a literature be? Did such interchanges occur, for example, in Asia? The second reason, as you know, without my needing to tell you, we are experiencing a moment in which many people question the acceptance, the acceptability even, of strangers, and thereby question the flexibility of liberal societies. Personally, I am a firm advocate of open and liberal societies. But as long as the question is being asked, it's worth answering. And I always think that comparing the conditions of societies remote from our own helps us to understand ourselves. How have cultural contacts in the past worked out? Between a high degree of permeability and a high degree of exclusiveness, what is the range of possibilities? The sorts of broad general answer that involve labels like globalization, modernization, or the cultural melting pot are not going to be of much help when considering distant times and places. Pre-modern China, just to take one example of a different society, was a multi-ethnic empire occupying a mostly continuous land mass. The majority Han population and the dominant elite with their Confucian education handled their encounters with cultural others in a variety of ways. Expansion, assimilation, exchange, and exclusion. Japanese, Koreans, and Vietnamese, on condition that they adopt the Chinese written language, could be absorbed into Chinese high culture with significant limits. What they wrote in their own languages was never read by Chinese until the modern period. Thus, there was no translation of masterpieces like, say, the tale of Genji until the 20th century. For cultures that did not adopt Chinese written characters, the barriers were even steeper. Tibetans, Mongolians, Manchus, and Uyghurs participated but little in the Chinese cultural conversation. This is strange because, as you know, China was often ruled by foreign dynasties. But the difference of writing systems seem to, seems to have been one conclusive factor. Most notably, no influence of Tibetan or Mongolian epic literature can be discerned in Chinese literature. It so happens that of my last two books, one was about epic and the other was about the history of translation into Chinese. Thus, my Berlin project combines these foci of interest in offering a picture of the flows and blockages of literary traditions across Asia. I think of the project as a nautical chart, 
a map that doesn't simply record static landmarks, but must also alert sailors to currents, tides, and sandbars not visible on the surface. And so to sit by the Wannsee, watching the white sails go back and forth on the lake, is a highly appropriate side activity to accompany it. I'll, I'll be speaking in December, by which time I hope to have some real results to show you. Thank you very much. Last and apparently least. My name is Rosalind Morris, and I would like to second the um, expression of gratitude and delight that my fellow fellows have already articulated. It's been an enormously empowering place to be already. I am professor of anthropology in the Department of Anthropology at Columbia University, where we still have a portrait and a bust of Franz Boas gathering a little dust in the lounge. I'm also honored to be the inaugural Andrew Double Mellon Fellow in the Humanities here at the American Academy in Berlin. Now you may be wondering how a social scientist comes to be a fellow in the humanities. And in fact, my work draws on many disciplines, not only anthropology, but history, art and art history, comparative literary study, film and media studies, gender and sexuality studies. I'm here to complete, or at least to move towards the completion of a book entitled Unstable Ground, about the lives, deaths, and afterlives of gold in Southern Africa. I'm also working on a film entitled We Are Zama Zama, and I should probably explain that phrase. Zama Zama is the name given to informal migrant miners who scavenge for gold in the ruins of formerly industrial mines. Zama means to try in Izizuru. Zama Zama means to keep on trying. It also means to gamble. And the people of whom I write are gamblers indeed. They stake everything on survival, as do many migrants in and from Africa today and as they have for many centuries. When I first started research in the area, a little more than 20 years ago, I was interested in the question of accident. Accident as a horizon, a lived experience, and accident as a concept metaphor for historical predicament. The sensation that one is born unjustly or without motive in a particular time and place and is subject to the vagaries of history as a result. As time went by, other questions emerged to displace or supplement the ones with which I began, as happens over the course of two decades. I found myself learning about how people try to survive the ravages of epidemic in what was the epicenter of the HIV AIDS epidemic in Southern Africa. How they engaged the task of democratization in the absence of economic surety. And what happens when an industry that was once the center of a global economy comes to a close as it is in South Africa. I now find myself working in the ruins observing the end of the gold era, where a new history of migrancy is now unfolding. Now, one of the nice things, more than nice things, one of the great honors and opportunities of being the Mellon Fellow is that it permits me to convene a group of thinkers, artists, and scholars around a set of issues related to my own research. So in January, we will meet here in Berlin to try to generate some new and more robust concepts with which to think the relationship between extraction and migrancy in the triangulated history that binds Germany, the United States, and Africa. It is, I think you'll probably all agree, a poignantly, if not painfully appropriate place to undertake that labor. For it was here in 1884 and 1885 that the European powers, with delegations from the United States, divided Africa among themselves, inaugurating a long, unfolding crisis that is not so much the crisis of and for Europe, as it is a crisis born of the fact that Europe came to depend on the division of and from Africa. I suppose you could say I'm here to undertake a double seance. If you would like to read more about my film, you can do so in the forthcoming issue of the Berlin Journal, for which I'm enormously grateful. 
Uh, if you'd like to hear me speak about some of these issues and join me in conversation in a slightly more dilatory way, I will be doing, I will be speaking about them on October 30th, and I would be delighted to see some of you here on that occasion. Thank you and good night. Um, it's me again, but it's not me in the sense that I have to present for our one final fellow who isn't here tonight, um, and that is the fall 2018 Bosch Fellow in Public Policy, Joshua Yaffa, who's the Moscow correspondent for The New Yorker. Uh, he's currently on assignment riding Siberian tigers bareback with President, President Putin somewhere <laughs> east of Habarovsk, but I'm assured that he's going to survive that, and he will be here to join us on the 19th this month. And we're looking forward to hearing about his exploits. Um, some of you might have read his recent piece in The New Yorker about Bill Browder, the investor who's had some uh, rather serious problems with President Putin, um, not to do with tigers, but to do with a lawyer who was killed in jail and a bunch of money that was stolen. Um, Joshua, is, uh, he did his undergraduate studies at Georgetown University, and he has a, has a master's in journalism and international affairs from Columbia. Uh, he's now working on a book about Russia in the age of Putin. Surprise, surprise. He is attempting to explain in his book how so many Russians, long after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, still find themselves so tightly caught up in what the sociologist Yuri Levada calls the intractable and symbiotic embrace with the state. His book will paint portraits of individuals living and working in today's Russia, some of them finding great success and power, others facing frustration and failure. Such everyday stories are important, says Joshua, because they have contributed, and these are his words, they have contributed to building the Putin system and to ensuring that it continues to durably function. So constructed around lengthy interviews, Joshua has devoted considerable time, as you can imagine, to engaging his subjects in discussion, which brings me back to Socrates, whom I mentioned earlier, the model thinker for the original academy that was set up in an olive grove in Athens by Plato around 387 BC. So this man, Socrates, wrote no books, left no doctrine, just a method of questioning that aimed to deepen thought. He would spend hours engaged in debate in search of the beautiful and the true, and he also developed a particular style of tweeting, which I'll get back to. Um, I like Socrates because he's one of the first philosophers that I read, and he led me to actually study philosophy along with German and Greek, um, and he always push, was always pushed by those two great questions of why are we here and what should we do, the metaphysical and the ethical. As Socrates knew very well, we cannot begin to answer these two weighty questions in 140 characters. You can begin a fight on Twitter, yes. You can make an incendiary statement. You can push out an insult or a provocation or make a false claim that goes viral, which is all too common on social media these days, unfortunately. But you cannot start a real discussion with a tweet. The American Academy in Berlin stands at the other end of this communication spectrum. We will go as deeply as we can into philosophy, literature, history, the visual and the musical arts, economics, political science, and technology. You've seen some of this tonight in the very interesting introductory uh, presentations from our current fellows. We make no apology for promoting rational discussions, discussions and even for provoking debate although it should always be civil, over some of the most vexing issues facing Americans and Germans today, and by extension, facing the world. We will welcome a diversity of opinions, left wing, right wing, no wings, without endorsing any position ourselves because we are nonpartisan, strictly nonpartisan. We also see our mission as international in scope, you cannot live in America or Germany today without paying attention to what is going on in China or in Russia or in the Middle East or elsewhere. You can try to turn your back on the world, but I will promise you the world will not turn its back on you. We will be particularly looking at Asia and China in particular as it becomes increasingly important for both Germany and the United States. As I've mentioned before, I grew up in Ireland, but I've lived in the United States on and off for the past 30 years. I would suggest that the world has always been worse off every time the United States has looked inwards and it turned its back on its neighbors. The US, I think, has a tremendous role to play in the world. It could only have been an American who could have 
brought an end to the desperate civil war in Northern Ireland over 30 years, brought, brought together those two divided parties. That, of course, was Senator George Mitchell and the Good Friday Peace Agreement. It took another great American diplomat to bring an end to the war in Bosnia. And that, of course, was Richard Holbrook, the man who dreamed up this academy where we sit tonight, and whom I met in a different context when he was working in the Afghanistan-Pakistan conflict. Richard knew that wars end with talking, never with shooting. And he also knew how important it is to understand the perspectives of everyone at the table, to listen to people with whom one disagrees in particular, and perchance to learn from them. Now, Germany has rebuilt itself today in ways that few people could have dreamed of when they wandered the bombed out streets of this city in 1945. Today, Germany is the world's fourth largest economy and a leader in many areas of applied sciences and engineering, technology, and the arts, although not, sadly, in soccer at the current moment. <laughs> I won't go there anymore. Germany, too, depends for its success and its security, I would venture, on looking outwards. The Academy's main mission is to foster the US-German relationship, even, and I might perhaps even be allowed to say particularly, when it is under threat by forces that are trying to weaken it or pull our two countries apart. We at the Academy will do this through deep scholarship, discussions and debates, and thoughtful listening to those who have other points of view and who insist on eating sausages for dinner, not just for breakfast. I look forward to leading the Academy in the coming months and years. we will be grateful for all your support and any suggestions and thoughts you might have for me. As for Socrates and his tweeting, which I'm reliably told by archaeologists he carried out on his Milo Iota phone. <laughs> Any Greek scholars here can get that? Model Hepta. Apparently, he was just tweeting to tell people to come over for another marathon dinner and an evening of being subjected to his relentless questioning. And in the name of Zeus, don't forget the wine. On that note, please join us for a glass of wine. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We're looking forward to a tremendous season, um, and we will continue our discussion privately.